A major problem that confronts anyone who comes up with a Jack the Ripper suspect is linking that person to the murders. Many of the suspects cannot be placed at or near the actual scenes of the crimes at the time or on the date on which they occurred, and a large percentage of them cannot be shown to have been in the area or even in London at the time. When a suspect can be placed in the area at the time and can even be linked to the scenes of the crimes, the case against them often comes down to the fact that they were in the vicinity around the times at which the atrocities took place, and on that basic and often shaky foundation, modern-day theorists who want to prove a particular suspect's guilt build their cases, mostly using little more than speculation to create narratives that, although sounding plausible, are on the whole nothing more than conjecture. In short, theorists have a tendency to come up with a suspect and to then use the mostly very scarce available facts to build their case, filling in the gaps with motives and backstories of their own invention, thoughts or actions that they themselves have added to the narrative, and opinions or hunches which they then proceed to put forward as ascertained facts. He might have, he could have, it's possible that, I believe that, are all phrases that should raise a red flag that a proponent of a particular theory has strayed into the murky realm of supposition. To paraphrase what Joseph Goebbels might have said, if you repeat a piece of speculation often enough, it becomes accepted as a fact. In any criminal investigation, the theory must fit the evidence, but in the cases against too many Jack the Ripper suspects, theorists try, often desperately, to make their theory fit the evidence. In our fast-paced age of instant gratification, when the void which inevitably exists in unsolved crime cases tends to irritate those who want instant solutions, charismatic theorists who can convincingly present their own speculative opinions or hunches as established facts will find themselves rewarded with a ready audience of eager followers, and it doesn't take long for a potentially innocent person, and remember that the premise of any criminal trial is that the accused is innocent until proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt to have their posthumous reputation torn to shreds in the boundless echo chamber of social media. This has certainly happened to Joseph Barnett. For those who may not be familiar with him, Joe Barnett was the paramour of Mary Kelly, the woman many now regard as having been the final victim of Jack the Ripper. Her murder, which took place in her room at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street in Spitalfields on Friday the 9th of November, 1888, was the most gruesome of all the Whitechapel atrocities, and looking at the crime scene photograph of her remains lying on the bed in that tiny room, you find yourself in full agreement with her landlord, John McCarthy, the second person to arrive at the scene, when he described what he saw in the room as looking more like the work of a devil than of a man. Until ten days prior to her murder, Mary Kelly had shared that room with Joseph Barnett, and many of those who were acquainted with the couple considered them man and wife. Almost all the information we have about Mary Kelly's life comes from what she had told Joseph Barnett, which he repeated at the inquest into her death, and to at least one reporter in the aftermath of her murder. Joseph Barnett first met Mary Kelly here on Commercial Street on Good Friday, April the 8th, 1887, and they went for a drink together. They agreed to meet again the next day, and then both decided that they should remain together. An article that appeared in the Penny Illustrated paper on Saturday the 17th of November, 1888, quoted Joseph Barnett as saying, I was in decent work in Billingsgate Market when I first met her and we lived along quite comfortably. She was fresh-looking and well-behaved, though she had been walking the streets some three years previously. Thereafter, they lived as a couple at various addresses around the East End of London. She lived with me first in George Street, he told the Penny Illustrated paper, then in Paternoster Court, Dorset Street, but we were ejected from our lodgings there because we went on a drunk and did not pay our rent. We took lodgings afterwards in Brick Lane and finally in Miller's Court, where the murder occurred. According to John McCarthy, the couple had rented the room ten months before, and their weekly rent was four shillings and sixpence, although by the time of her death the rent was twenty-nine shillings in arrears. Testifying at the inquest, McCarthy admitted that he did not concern himself to know whether they were married or not, 
adding that they seemed to live comfortably enough. Barnet was thirty years old at the time of the Ripper murders. He was five foot seven inches tall, of medium build with a fair complexion, blue eyes and a moustache. Since 1878, he had earned his living as a porter here at Billingsgate Fish Market. However, he lost his job in July 1888, the reason it has been suggested by those who champion him as a suspect being that he was caught stealing, although there is no actual documented proof that this was the case. The loss of his job put a strain on the couple's meagre resources, and Mary Kelly had returned to prostitution in order to make ends meet. In his inquest testimony, Barnett admitted that they occasionally quarrelled, and during one argument, a window of the room had been broken. There had been an altercation between them on Tuesday the 30th of October. Blows had been exchanged, objects had been thrown, and Joseph Barnett had moved out. The cause of this particular argument and of their subsequent separation was, according to Barnett, the fact that Mary had insisted on taking in a woman of a moral or bad character out of compassion, and he objected and left. In his police statement given to Inspector Aberline on the day of the murder, Barnett recalled that She told me that she had obtained her livelihood as a prostitute for some considerable time before I took her from the streets. He also told Abeline that, in consequence of not earning sufficient money to give her and her resorting to prostitution, I resolved on leaving her, but I was friendly with her. He told the inquest that Mary had, on several occasions, asked him to read to her about the Whitechapel murders, observing that she seemed afraid of someone, although she didn't express fear of any particular individual, except when she rowed with him, although, he added, we always came to terms quickly. Having left 13 Mothers Court, Barnard took up residence at a lodging house in New Street off Bishopsgate, a five to ten minute walk from Dorset Street. However, he continued to visit Mary on a daily basis and would give her money if he had any. He last saw her alive on the evening of Thursday the 8th of November when he stopped by 13 Mothers Court at between 7.30 and 7.45pm where he found her in the company of another woman who he did not know. They chatted for about an hour, and at some stage during this time, the other woman left. Barnet left shortly afterwards, but before he went, he told Mary that he was very sorry that he had no work and was therefore unable to give her any money. He then returned to his accommodation on New Street, where he remained for the rest of the evening. The next day, he heard that there had been a murder in Miller's Court and headed over there. En route, he met his sister's brother-in-law, who told him that the victim was Mary. He went to Miller's Court and there saw the police inspector and told him who he was and where he had been the previous night. Given his history with the victim, the police obviously viewed Barnet as a person of interest in her murder and in consequence he was questioned for more than four hours by Inspector Aberline and his clothes were minutely examined for any traces of blood. None were found, and having satisfied the police that he had not been in any way involved in Mary Kelly's murder, he left police custody completely vindicated of any suspicion. The Penny Illustrated paper quoted him as saying, Marie never went on the streets when she lived with me, she would never have gone wrong again, and I should never have left if it had not been for the prostitutes stopping in the house. She only let them in the house because she was good-hearted and did not like to refuse them shelter on cold, bitter nights. It is worth pointing out that Barnet may have been treading carefully in his various statements, since, had he admitted that Mary Kelly had worked as a prostitute during their time together, he may have left himself open to a charge of living off immoral earnings. Barnet had the unenviable task of identifying Mary's body, and at the inquest, at which he was the first witness called, he confirmed that, I have seen the body. I identify her by the ear and eyes. I am positive that it is the same woman I have lived with. On Monday the 19th of November, Joseph Barnett was the chief mourner at the funeral of Mary Kelly, and he was in the first of two carriages that followed the coffin as it was conveyed through immense crowds on its way to St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Leytonstone, where the woman whom Barnett had known as Marie Jeanette Kelly was laid to rest in a common grave. And with that, Barnett's association with the Whitechapel murders came to an end. 
Now, you've probably noticed that other than his four-hour spell in police custody, there is nothing to suggest that Barnett was ever a serious suspect. Indeed, he was able to convince the experienced Inspector Abiline that he hadn't in any way been involved in Mary's murder, and a few days later, at the inquest into her death, the coroner, Dr. Roderick MacDonald, was so impressed by Barnett's composure as he gave evidence that he afterwards observed, You have given your evidence very well indeed. So how has Joseph Barnett's name turned up on the ever-expanding list of Jack the Ripper suspects? Well, the case against him largely boils down to his being involved with Mary Kelly, being in the area at the time, and to a few canards about the crimes that have long been discounted by serious students of the case. Much of the supposed evidence against him consists of an awful lot of supposition, little of which is backed up by concrete facts. The strongest pieces of evidence are that he undoubtedly knew Mary Kelly, by his own admission had argued with her, and that he was in the immediate area at the time of her murder, thus enabling him to fit many modern-day profiles. Those who accuse him of her murder propose that his motive was that he was passionately in love with her, and during their time together the thought that she might go back onto the streets troubled him no end. Whilst he held down a secure job at Billingsgate Market and the couple were able to live comfortably together, he had no trouble preventing this from happening. But when in July 1888 he lost that job, Mary returned to prostitution. Desperate to discourage her in this dissolute lifestyle and to encourage her to settle down with him, Joseph Barnett began brutally murdering other prostitutes in an attempt to frighten her away from an immoral life. At first this worked. But at the end of October, Mary invited another prostitute to stay in their room, and Barnett strenuously objected, causing the couple to fight on the 30th of October, after which he moved out. Joseph, though, continued to visit and made several attempts at reconciliation. After a failed last-ditch attempt, he was forced to accept that it was over between them, and overcome by jealousy and rage, he murdered her, the mutilations being so terrible, because this time it was personal. Those who favour him also point out that, as a porter working at Billingsgate Market, Barnett would have filleted fish and would therefore have possessed a filleting and boning knife, the weapon that he used to carry out the murders. However, it should be noted that Barnett wasn't a fishmonger, but rather a porter whose job would have been to move the produce around the market. Barnett, so those who believe in his guilt hold, matched the descriptions given by witnesses who may have seen the face of the murderer, although I have to say that his proponents do tend to be somewhat selective when it comes to which witnesses they put forward. There were, it is true, similarities between Barnett's appearance and some witness descriptions, but witnesses such as Elizabeth Long, who saw Annie Chapman talking with a man outside 29 Hanbury Street 30 or so minutes before her body was discovered, described an older, shorter and foreign-looking man. Then we come to the crime scene itself. When the order was eventually given to enter the room, John McCarthy had to force the door open with a pickaxe because the door was locked from the inside. According to the Times on Saturday the 10th of November, the lock of the door was a spring one, and the murderer apparently took the key away with him when he left, as it cannot be found. However, Joseph Barnett told Abilene that he and Mary had lost the key to the room some time before, and that they used to reach through the broken window to unlock the door. Those who propose Barnett's candidature suggest that Barnett had in fact kept the key when he moved out, and he used it to let himself into the room, and having carried out the murder, locked the door with it as he left. Next we come to the only physical evidence that places Barnett at the scene of the crime, a pipe that was found in the room which Barnett admitted to Inspector Abilene belonged to him. Those who champion him argue that if, as he claimed, when he moved out he took his possessions with him, then he must have left the pipe behind after he had committed the murder, otherwise it had no business being at the scene. I will leave it to you, dear viewer, to identify the possible flaws with that particular argument. On the 30th of September, the night of the double murder, when Elizabeth Stride was murdered in Berners Street and Catherine Eddowes in Mitre Square, the escape route taken by the killer from Mitre Square led, according to one of those who accuse him, to Barnett's then home, Miller's Court in Dorset Street. 
Indeed, it is worth quoting this claim in full. He washed his hands at a public sink. The bloody water was still flowing down the drain. Where was the sink? Miller's Court, 26 Dorset Street, the same place where he would later kill Kelly. Coincidence? Hardly. Major Smith claimed he was five minutes behind the Ripper that night. In fact, he must have been seconds behind him. The only place the killer could have gone is through his own front door. In the interests of accuracy, I should point out that there never was any bloody water still flowing down a drain, and the one man who said that there was, Major Henry Smith, who at the time was the acting City of London Police Commissioner, did not specify the location as being Miller's Court, only that it had been in Dorset Street. It should also be noted that the only mention of the bloody water appears in Smith's autobiography, From Constable to Commissioner, The Story of Sixty Years, Most of Them Misspent, published in 1910, a book that is a highly entertaining read, but which, to be polite, doesn't let the facts stand in the way of a good story. In none of the police reports, newspaper articles or inquest evidence from 1888 was there any mention of bloody water being found flowing down a drain anywhere, let alone in Dorset Street. There are several other points used by those who suggest that Joseph Barnett was Jack the Ripper, but the majority of them would never stand up in court and most certainly wouldn't convince any unbiased jury of his guilt beyond reasonable doubt. The evidence against him is at best circumstantial and coincidental, and at worst fabrication, and although circumstantial evidence is admissible in court, I will leave it to you, the viewer, to decide whether the case against him meets the criminal standard of proof, or whether it is simply speculative conjecture that has been put forward as established fact. Let me know your opinions in the comments section below.